I hope you remember all about the cybernetic model of the viable system, because this model deeply underlies the story I want to tell you now. We shan't see the model again, so let's take a quick rehearsal of it. Here were the parts of the organization, which I called Systems One, and you remember about their cybernetic interaction with the outside world. Those systems will go into oscillation, we said, unless there is a System Two, which is this, intended precisely to damp that oscillation. Then we have our first corporate management level, the total organization management, dealing with the inside of the system right here and now. And in contrast to that, System Four, dealing with the future and the outside. And then the task of top management, right up there, System Five, perceived as mainly being about monitoring the homeostat that connects three and four. That's how it was. Now, the story that I want to tell you uh, began in uh, 1971, in the middle of the year. I had been going around using this model that I have explained to you in big companies, in agencies, in all sorts of places. And then I suddenly got a letter which very much changed my life. It was from the technical general manager of the State Planning Board of Chile. Remember, 1971, President Allende was in office. He uh, remarked in this letter uh, that he had studied all my works, he had collected a team of scientists together, and would I please come and take it over? Uh, I could hardly believe it, as you can imagine. But this was to start me on a, on a journey which uh, made me travel 8,000 miles over and over and over again. I was commuting between London and Santiago for two years. While well, that model of the viable systems in your mind, let me tell you what happened when I first explained it to President Yendi himself. Yendi was a doctor, a medical doctor, as you may know. And therefore, it was very easy to explain the model to him in terms of neuro-cybernetics as the way of controlling the body. And then I went into the business of controlling the state. And so I said to him, let us suppose that these elements of the state are the big departments of state, like the foreign affairs and the economy and home affairs, and so on. And then we'll have those, and the following things will happen, and then we must have a system two, and I built it up on a piece of paper lying on the table between us. Then a system three and a system four, and I got that far. And then I got to system five, and I drew a, a big histrionic breath, and I said, I was going to say, this compañero presidente is you. Before I could say it, he suddenly smiled very broadly, and he said, ah, System 5, at last, the people. That was a pretty uh, powerful uh, thing to happen. It had a very big influence on me. Uh, I can't go into that aspect, the political aspect in this uh, program. It's not what it's about. But I'm sure you'll bear in mind that I don't have to go and work in places where I don't want to be. What happened when I got to Chile and took over this uh, team? Let us look at a little diagram to show how I set about things. Politics, yes indeed. Politics is the essence of this, although I've said I'm not going to discuss the politics, obviously essential. Cybernetics essential, that's what I'd gone to do. And somehow we had to make a political and cybernetic analysis and bring it together. Now, you'll see that I have written there recursive model, and not just model of the viable system, although that's what it was. And I want to explain what this idea of recursion is all about. If there is such a thing as a valid cybernetic model of a viable system, then you will expect it to operate wherever you have a viable system. One of the things you notice as you look around is that every viable system has parts, that's the systems one, which are themselves viable. And that same viable system with those viable parts is itself part of another viable system. 
This is what the idea of recursion says. Now, recursion is a mathematical word, and technically I use it in a mathematical sense. But the explanation I have just given is, is quite enough for our purposes. But inside every viable system, we shall find another. So, you see, I set out to model Chile in terms of its society, of which the parts are easily identifiable, in big chunks, as I said, foreign affairs, for instance, internal affairs, for instance, and then recursively to model each of those chunks, and so on, down. We analyzed both society and the economy. Now, that's a bit lopsided, but that's how it was, because, after all, the government is about controlling society, but Chile, at that time, was very much about the control of the economy, and that's why the economy got such emphasis. And what I'm going to be talking about today is primarily about the economy. At the moment, I'm giving you the picture. Let's look at the, the next uh, slide. The recursive model, how do we apply it? Just look at that mess on the screen. Under society, first of all, I designed those S principles there. There were five of them, roughly relating to the five levels of the viable system, where I tried to express in human terms what the cybernetic understanding of society is about, with a view to propagating this knowledge among the people through booklets, through songs, through posters, as you see it written there. That was a lot of fun. I got into very close friendship with a number of the leading, uh, sorry, leading Chilean uh, singers, guitarists, songwriters, and I even wrote songs myself about cybernetics, would you believe? And that's how we tried to get that side of things going. We wanted to use radio, as you see. We wanted to use slogans, because the Chileans uh, were very aware of the role that these had played in the uh, Cuban uh, government. And then I come over to the right-hand side, and you see that word, cyber synergy, under the heading economy. Well, this is the project I'm discussing now. This was the project to use the viable system model in order to create a synergy, that is, a drawing together and explosion of a potential throughout the economy. This had been, by this point, very largely nationalized, as you probably remember. We had uh, at least 200 of the major firms accounting for more than 60% of the whole uh, national economy under the control of this organization I mentioned, uh, the state planning organization. And so we wanted to use these media uh, to promote our project of cyber synergy, to use film, uh, to use television, uh, to use VTR. We never got that far, although we had uh, plans well advanced. And then to close the loop, you see that word algidonic meters. I don't think that I had time in the last program to tell you about algidonics. Algidonics means pleasure and pain. And really, the intention of that loop at the bottom of the diagram was entirely to indicate that we had to get a response from the people to everything we were doing. And we made some very profound plans uh, to achieve that. Again, not part of this story and not completed. Two years I'm talking about. And I think you'll find that we did quite a lot in two years. Could I have the next slide, please? This is, indeed, the economy. And here you see what I was saying about recursion. We've got the state, foreign affairs, let's say, uh, home affairs. This one is a system one of the whole nation dealing with the economy. Let us make a recursion. Now we have the economy. And so on down. These are the dramas, the big major branches of industry, heavy industry, light industry, materials industry, and consumer industry. Four ramas. And we can take a rama, do a recursion, make another viable systems model of one of those ramas. 
now we find that our systems one are sectors. These sectors are what we should usually call industries, like fishing, like textiles, like iron and steel. So when we make a viable system model of a sector, a whole industry, we find that the elements are enterprises or firms. If we make a model of any one firm by recursion, we then find that the elements of the viable system are plants. And this is how we worked through the economy, modeling everything by recursion, always against the same model which we studied last time. On this side, I'm showing the workers and their interaction with, uh, with the uh, formal part that I was just explaining. We have the body of the workers, we have the trade unions, which is CUT in Chile, exactly the opposite, you notice, of TUC. I think it must be because it's in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> and inside CUT, we have the branch and the chapel. I've used the English words for these, not the Spanish words, because they're a, sl a somewhat different organization. But I think you'll see, uh, you'll understand how, how that's organized. And then down here again, at the plant level, there comes this closing of the loop, this interaction uh, of the people with their work. This is where the action is. So this edifice we built. We had to make a lot of models, and I'll talk more about that uh, towards the end. What I want to talk about now is this. How do you control an economy? As we sit in England, we may feel, well, the answer to that is you don't. Probably you remember that when Mr. Macmillan was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he made a very famous remark. He made several, but the one that I have in mind, he said, um, running the economy is like trying to catch a train on last year's timetable. And indeed it was. His data were about a year out of date. Uh, not so long ago, uh, in 1973, uh, Mr. Harold Wilson gave his presidential address as president of the Royal Statistical Society, and he was saying that during his government, that uh, period of a year or so had been collapsed to six or eight months or so. Big achievement. Well, I'll tell you what I think about this. I've got a diagram up here which tries to relate, in a very simple-minded way, I admit, facts and the information we have about the facts. As you can see, economic data is normally cyclic, cyclical. We, we're used to that. As you can see, we have a fact line doing this, and at these two points exceeding the danger limits that I've marked on the diagram. The information about those facts, however, is lagged, as I've just said, by six or eight months. So what happens? What happens is that just after this crisis is over, you see here, things are now improving, we get the information that we are in for a crisis. Therefore, we say stop, hold everything, or take more money, take away money from the economy, just after the trend has gone in the other direction. If you look at it here, you see exactly the same thing. Here's the fact, you've been in danger, you're now coming down, you're going to be all right, but at this point, wow, all the signals blow, and you think you're in danger, and you say stop, and this is how, basically, I think as a cybernetician, we get to a stop-go economy. <coughs> now, these... Uh, Features of information flow are met pretty much concealed by all sorts of things in the real-life economy. That's why it isn't as obvious as I've suggested it is. Nonetheless, I do claim to detect that mechanism operating. And so I say to myself, well, how do we get over this? Like, why is it in a technological age we are stuck with information that's six, eight months out of date and causes the government to take exactly the wrong decision each time? We don't have to do that. We have a technology which deals instantaneously with communications. And so when I got to Chile, I determined to make data flow instantaneous. Never mind making an improvement on six to eight months. The idea was just this. 
if we could find points in the economy at which to measure things, those measures would be sent every day, continuously, to computers which could analyze them and produce answers. Then we haven't got the problem with lag. I often say it's better to dissolve a problem than to solve it. So this is what we set out to do. What we have on the screen now is a typical communication center in Chile. We had a very, very big problem uh, to solve here. Because although there is such a thing as advanced technology, and many of you will know about teleprocessing and all that goes with that stuff, Chile had no money. Chile, Chile was being blockaded economically. What we had was telex machines. So there's nothing super sophisticated about this. But you can communicate more or less instantaneously by telex, so why not? So that is the kind of network we set up. All the dots are telex machines, centralizing information uh, through uh, one node and then a set of nodes centralizing to another in every uh, <coughs> kind of uh, habited place. I wonder if you realize just how big a problem this is. What do you know about Chile? I wonder if we could look at the map we have over here. It's a long, thin country, nearly 3,000 miles uh, high as, you, as we look at it on the map and barely 100 miles across. Up in the north there you see Arica and below that is a desert with a rainfall of about half a millimeter a year. Very dry, that's where the nitrate mines are. In the south where you see Puerto Montt on the other hand there's an unbelievable rainfall of two and a half meters a year hardly ever stops pouring down. And so it is that in Santiago and the towns on the coast near Santiago is the most beautiful mix of these, these two extreme climates you could possibly imagine. It must be rather like the Garden of Eden. It's always, almost always, like a, an English summer day. There's enough rain, but not too much. Sunny, gets a bit hot in January, but that's the picture. As to people, they are very strangely distributed. There are 10 million people in Chile, and about 4 million of them live in Santiago and outlying uh, districts, about another million on the coast. If we add 2 million up in Arica and 2 million down in Punta Arenas, we've pretty well uh, accounted for the place. Nonetheless, there are towns spread all along that, and the communications problem is enormous. Well, fortunately, uh, that had all been solved before I got there for other reasons. There is a, a microwave link between Santiago and Arica, uh, and between Santiago and Puerto Montt, and there is high-frequency radio link uh, from Puerto Montt to Punta Arenas. And this was the thing that we mobilized, and now we can look at the schematic of it. Here we have it, the whole 3,000 miles, all coming to a telephone switchboard on a daily basis, all this information, going here to the cybernetic uh, network center, which can handle these data using, of course, a computer. Now, I have been very much blamed for doing this, <coughs> and I resent uh, the blame I've had very much. I've been told that uh, I centralized power for Dr. Yende. Now, uh, this isn't the case at all, as I'm going to try and show you in a minute. Uh, these data were not used uh, in a autocratic fashion at all. Uh, they all went to one computer because we only had one computer. And if you've only got one computer, then ipso facto, you're centralized. But we were not centralized in the uh, political uh, sense in which this has been taken up by some critics. 